Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Joy Murphy, Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum. And this is our Lunch and Learn, our monthly program. Today we are pleased to welcome Tim Reed, who is the De Deputy Director at National Archives in Kansas City. And he is going to talk to us about fortune and providence in the life of a leader. So take it away, Tim. Thank you, Joy. It's nice to be back. I spent uh, 2008 to early 2021 at the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum as the supervisory archivist and the deputy director. And who would have thought when I actually left the office in March 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic that I would not return to the Eisenhower Library until August 2022 and only then as a virtual guest. Um, but we never know what um, fortune or providence has planned for us, a thought which conveniently leads to my topic today, and that is, what is the role of fortune or providence in the life of a leader? And my musings, of course, will focus on Ike. There is a continuing debate among scholars whether leaders are born or made. Is it nature or nurture? Is there some magic mix of genes, experience, and historical context that combine to create, say, a, a Joan of Arc, a Winston Churchill, or a Dwight Eisenhower? Or might there be other factors that explain the creation and success of a leader? Intangible forces like fortune and providence, luck and divine intervention, if you will. Was it a roll of the dice or the hand of God? In other words, to the question of whether leaders are born or made, may we add and ask, are they chosen? And further, do they continue to be favored somehow by these invisible forces of divine intervention or blind chance? Are some leaders just simply lucky and or blessed? I am actually of two minds on the luck versus providence subject. I believe Ike was too. And I think the best example is um, the order of the day best example is the order of the day that he issued before the D-Day invasion in which he exhorted the troops. And Samantha, do we have that up on the screen? I hope you can see this. If Maybe if you can't all read it. But in, in the last paragraph of the order of the day, Eisenhower wrote, good luck and let us all beseech the blessing and of almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. So good luck and let us pray for God's intervention. I carried a handful of talismans during the war. And again, we see the luck providence dichotomy for in addition to lucky coins from the principal allied nations, I carried a miraculous medal that is of the Virgin Mary and also a St. Christopher medal. In other words, Ike hedged his bet. The D-Day invasion succeeded. Was it luck or did almighty God hear the allies prayers and intervene in the battle to tip the scales in their favor. And I'll leave that question hanging for now. Some of Eisenhower's peers considered him a lucky general, and this was not exactly a compliment as it implied that it was luck rather than strategic or tactical acumen that brought him success. Some biographers have picked up on the notion of Ike as especially lucky as the organizing principle of their interpretation. Gene Edward Smith, for example, and Eisenhower in War and Peace employs the idea of Fortuna in his book on the general. Fortuna was the Greek goddess of fortune or chance. Smith identifies key moments of Fortuna in Ike's life from his boyhood through his presidency. For example, the decision by Kansas Senator Joseph Bristow to base service academy appointments on a competitive exam rather than the applicant's social or political connections. The advocacy by West Point officials uh, for Ike's active duty commission rather than discharge despite a serious leg injury, as you recall from playing football and then exacerbated by um, further injury during a cavalry horse mounting drill. Um, another fortunate case in Smith's view was Ike's selection by General Fox Connor uh, to be Connor's executive officer in Panama, which may have actually prevented Ike uh, from being court-martialed, that's another story. His selection as the Supreme Commander of the invasion in North Africa in 1942 his appointment to command the cross-channel invasion of Normandy on D-Day and his 1955 heart attack, although it's hard to see that as, a, as um, uh, fortunate, although Smith has some reasons why. At any rate, um, numerous biographers have seen Ike as lucky. 
Ike's luck was also the subject of contemporary observers as well. In the hours following the D-Day invasion, a reporter noted Ike's good fortune in picking successful invasion dates well in advance, as now proven on three important occasions, that is, North Africa, Sicily, and Normandy. A general need luck, needs luck, Eisenhower admitted. I'd rather have a lucky general than a smart general, he said. They win battles. In addition to his adventitious military successes, Eisenhower was also considered politically lucky. Quote, he has long been fortune's favored child, noted the columnist Marquise Childs in 1956, late in Eisenhower's first presidential term. Eisenhower luck has seen him through mishaps and misadventures that would have blighted less fortunate men. It seems this luck to have been part of his temperament, an element in the buoyant, confident, persuasive nature of the army officer who has moved in a few crowded years from obscurity to become one of the half dozen leaders of a world in crisis, unquote. Well, what accounted for Ike's alleged luck? Was it simply random chance? Was it the hand of God? Was it dictated by some occult cosmic numerology? According to Rudy Torelli of Merrimack Caverns, Missouri, it was because of Ike's lucky number 13. Why the counterintuitive 13, you ask? Well, it's because there are 13 letters in the name Ike Eisenhower and Richard Nixon, as well as in the names of administration officials or cabinet members Sherman Adams, Charles Wilson, James Mitchell, and Charles Thomas, to name but a few. Uh, Torelli added that there are also 13 letters in Abilene, Kansas, and then the auspicious dates of November 4th, 1952, date of Ike's first election, and January 20th, 1953, the date of Ike's first inauguration. Uh, for what it's worth, um, my name also has 13 letters, um, but I'm a long ways from ever becoming president of the United States. Other numerologists beg to differ with Mr. Uh, Torelli. Ike's lucky number was seven, Hollywood publicist George Maines averred. And for proof, he offered the North African invasion date of November 7th, 1942, the fall of Tunisia on May 7th, 1943. Victory in Europe was achieved on May 7th, 1945. Ike retired as Army Chief of Staff on February 7th, 1948. And let us not forget the biggest push to Ike's career, the entry of the United States into World War II on December 7th, 1941. But the date for the North African invasion, as all you Eisenhower scholars know, was actually November 8th. 1942, so we should perhaps be wary of Mr. Bain's computations. There were others who saw Ike's success as ordained by God, most famously George S. Patton Jr., who christened his comrade Divine Destiny Eisenhower. This may have been employed somewhat sarcastically by old blood and guts, but he clearly believed in divine providence and destiny, especially in his own case. And if you'd like to read more about that, and it's actually fairly entertaining, just read his diary sometimes sometime. But Eisenhower also discerned the hand of a higher power at work in the events of his career. Looking back on the invasion of Normandy from 1952, Ike said that this day eight years ago, I made the most agonizing decision of my life. If there were nothing else in my life to prove the existence of an almighty and merciful God, the events of the next 24 hours did it. The greatest break in a terrible outlay of weather occurred the next day and allowed the great invasion to proceed with losses far below that which we anticipated. Well, be it luck or providence, Fortuna or God, Eisenhower observe, observers believe that Ike was somehow touched, somehow chosen by whatever mysterious forces determine the outcome of our lives. I cannot solve the mystery of chance versus providence in the life of Dwight Eisenhower today, but I can present really uncanny anecdotal evidence, which I think points to the role of a determining force or of at least consistently fortuitous circumstances which directed his life at critical junctures and decision points. My approach is by means of what one might call comparative alternative destinies. Now I'm sure my method has absolutely no scholarly credibility, but that's never stopped me in the past and it won't be an obstacle today as we examine this topic. My plan is to look at the lives and fates of three young men who appeared briefly and perhaps the most important episode in Eisenhower's early life, and that is his effort to win a place at one of the military service academies. Ironically, although these three young men failed in their attempt to win the appointment Ike received, they all eventually obtained assignments and opportunities coveted by Ike early in his career, and their respective fates are thought-provoking. 
I'll approach each alternative destiny as a what if question. First, what if I had received an appointment to the Naval Academy at Annapolis instead of the Military Academy at West Point? Second, what if Eisenhower had pressed forward with his intention to become an aviator before the First World War? And third, what if Eisenhower had received the combat command he so relished in France during the Great War during World War I? Now, I'm sure most of us here today are familiar with the story of Ike's Road to West Point, but a brief recap is in order. And you can see that the picture that we had on the screen was Ike as a, a young graduate of the class of 1909. While Eisenhower's parents, David and Ida, strongly encouraged the education of Ike and his surviving five brothers, the financial resources to send them to college were limited. The boys would have to find and fund their own way. Ike and brother Edgar, both graduates of the Abilene High School class of 1909, devised a plan to support each other by alternating work and school years. Edgar went first and began at the University of Michigan. Ike supported him by working 12 hour days at the Bell, Scream, Bell Springs Creamery, among other jobs. And as luck or providence would have it, Ike renewed his acquaintance with Everett Swede Hazlitt around this same time, who told Ike about his hopes to obtain an appointment to the US Naval Academy at Annapolis. Hazlitt encouraged his friend to pursue a place among the midshipmen as well in order to achieve his dream of a college education without the intervals of backbreaking boiler room work. Ike wrote Senator Joseph Bristow to notify him of his interest and learned that the Senator would award the appointment to the applicant scoring the highest on a competitive exam to be offered in Topeka on October 4th and 5th, 1910. Between shifts at the creamery, Ike returned to Abilene High School to bone up on mathematics and other subjects as well as to play a little football. And I believe we have a image of Senator Bristow, which I'd never really noticed what the guy looked like before. He looks kind of like a librarian or an archivist. Um, seven other boys joined Ike in Topeka to take the exam under the eye of State Superintendent of Education E.T. Fairchild. Those boys were George L. Campbell of Wilsey, Arthur N. Jones of Enterprise, Alva J. Moore of Larned, Aaron A. Platner of Ellis, um, Alan W. Vogelli of Sabetha, William C. Battelle of Lawrence and George Pulsifer Jr. of Leavenworth. And there was in the next slide, there's a picture of a clipping that appeared in the Topeka paper about the boys coming to town uh, to take the appointment. And as was often the case during the early days of Eisenhower's career, his name was, was misspelled, as you can see there. Um, the applicants were tested in eight subjects over those two days, U.S. history, general history, geography, spelling, grammar, geometry, algebra, and arithmetic. Topeka school teachers graded the results. George Pulsifer won the day with the highest composite score of 89 and 4 eighths, followed by Eisenhower at 87 and 7 eighths. Aaron Plattner finished third. Pulsifer was named first for the West Point list. Eisenhower tops for the Annapolis berth. I could learn since his initial inquiries with Senator Bristow, however, that he would be ineligible for the Naval Academy due to his age. This meant that he must somehow get the West Point nod if he had any hope of attending one of the free service schools. And here again, we see perhaps another example of Eisenhower's good fortune. Although Pulsifer had the higher score, Ike received the Bristow appointment based on the superiority of his letters of recommendation. Now, for many years, Eisenhower mistakenly believed that he had become the primary selection because Pulsifer had failed the physical examination. Pulsifer, in fact, had instead been appointed to the Academy by another congressman and would join Ike as a member of the class of 1915. At any rate, Eisenhower proceeded on to Jefferson Barracks at St. Louis to take the actual West Point entrance examination and physical exam, along with Aaron Plattner, who went as his alternate. Alva J. Moore finished third on the Annapolis list in 1910, but returned a year later to capture an appointment and become a member of the Annapolis class of 1916. Now, the other unsuccessful candidates uh, for an appointment to Annapolis or West Point now fade from our narrative and exit the stage for the time being. I wonder, however, how many of them remembered taking the test along with Ike that day and wondered if they too uh, would have ascended to the same heights as Eisenhower had they been given that chance? And we'll revisit this, this question later. Um, next slide, please. I think it's one. Yeah, this is one I just threw in because, because I found it. Um, when the boys went to Topeka for a couple of days, they stayed downtown at the National Hotel. 
And so Ike would have been there uh, for two days uh, with his fellow applicants and got to know them you know, just a little bit over that time. Well, um, of the non-successful applicants, uh, those are roads not taken by others. Let's look again at the roads not taken by Ike due to chance or choice or providence. And again, let's look at these roads through the lives and destinies of three of the young men who sat for the service academy examinations with Eisenhower in the superintendent's office in Topeka, now nearly 112 years ago. We'll consider the question, what if Eisenhower had gone to Annapolis through the experience of Alva J. Moore? Born March 5th, 1893 in Arcola, Illinois, Moore moved to Larnard, Kansas in his youth where his widowed mother, mother kept a boarding house. Moore graduated from Larnard High School in 1910. Following his failure to win an academy spot in 1911, Moore attended a Naval Academy preparatory school where he finished at the top of his class. He passed the written and physical examinations Annapolis required and was appointed by Representative E.H. Madison of the Kansas 7th Congressional District. Moore's hometown Larned Coronascope newspaper predicted, quote, his many friends here who have known him during the few years he has resided here have no doubt that he will make a success in the life work he has chosen as he has always stood for clean, honorable, and upright young manhood. A spare, even-tempered fellow, Moore was a popular of quiet midshipmen. Alvin never says much to anybody, the lucky bag, which was the Academy yearbook writers reported. He will talk when you do, and you can never get him excited, nor can you ever lead out his goat. He is not much on springing jokes and grandstand wit, but if you want a friend who will do the right thing by you at times, one who will always do his utmost for you, Ajax, his nickname, is that man. Moore graduated on June 2nd, 1916 into a very uncertain world as war raged in Europe and in the nearby waters off America's coast. He joined the battleship USS South Carolina and the Atlantic Fleet, pardon me, which was just shoving off for maneuvers in the war-threatened ocean. A year later, Moore was detached from the South Carolina and ordered to the submarine school at New London, Connecticut. Moore served aboard numerous submarines over the next few years, patrolling the coast for German subs after the U.S. joined the Great War. Following the conflict, he continued in the Atlantic Fleet with occasional visits to Cristobal in the Panama Canal Zone, which coincided with Eisenhower's own time in the region. Ike, as you recall, spent 1924, 1922 to 1924 in Panama under the tutelage of General Fox Connor, a period Eisenhower later described as a sort of graduate seminar in military history and the humanities. But as Ike grew in knowledge of his profession, deadly bacilli were growing in the lungs of Lieutenant Moore. By the fall of 1923, Moore was so ill that he was committed to the Naval Hospital in Washington. He was soon transferred to Fitzsimmons General Hospital in Denver, where, coincidentally, Eisenhower would recover from his 1955 heart attack. But unlike Ike, Moore's condition worsened to the point where the Naval Retiring Board found him to be, quote, incapacitated for active service by reason of tuberculosis, pulmonary, chronic, slightly active, and far advanced. And that incapacity is permanent and a result of incident of service, unquote. In other words, Moore likely contacted tuberculosis while serving on the submarine. The Navy placed, placed Moore on the retired list on November 28, 1924. He left Fitzsimmons General Hospital to take up residence at the Pottinger Sanatorium, Sanitarium in Monrovia, California, where he died. On January 27, 1927, Alva J. Moore was 33 years old. Um, there's a few slides here. Interestingly, there were pictures of three of the subs uh, that Moore served on in the late teens. And then um, also a, a picture of where he spent uh, his final days um, in California. Our second what if question is, what if Eisenhower had become an aviator early in his career? Sometime in 1915, not long after arriving at Fort Sam Houston, Texas from West Point, Eisenhower applied for the Army's new aviation section. Quote, I saw it as a new military venture, which some people thought was going to have real value, as well as providing entertainment, Ike recalled in his memoir, At Ease. He also liked the prospect of the 50% pay raise especially in light of his recent engagement to Miss Mamie Dowd. Ike was on the verge of taking his flight physical when his prospective in-laws learned of his plans to join the air service. They presented him with a stark choice, 
our daughter, or the airplane. You can't have both. After two miserable days of seeking some sort of compromise, Ike decided to drop the matter and grounded the idea. His co-competitor on the academy exam and eventual classmate George Pulsifer, however, would take to the skies. An army brat, Pulsifer was born on May 7, 1893 in Texas. The family then moved to Fort Leavenworth, where his father was the post commissary sergeant. Despite his initial application for the patronage of Senator Bristow, Pulsifer was appointed at large on the recommendation of Representative Daniel Reed Anthony Jr. of the Kansas 1st Congressional District. Point of interest, uh, Representative Anthony was the nephew of Susan B. Anthony. The Academy's Howitzer Yearbook described Pulsifer as, quote, one who aspires to serve the nation in a humble capacity. Tis true, but a man from Kansas lacks facilities for boning up much capacity. Kerry Nation attended to that, and it seems just possible that this project of George's is merely part of a deep, dark plot whereby he hopes to get even with Kerry, unquote. I don't know why I included that, because almost all these yearbook descriptions are kind of inscrutable and nonsensical and are full of inside jokes. At any rate, that was the West Point take on George Pulsifer as a cadet. Following graduation, Pulsifer was assigned to the 23rd Infantry Regiment, where he soon, like Ike, applied for the aviation service. And again, unlike Ike, Pulsifer completed his plans and became a pilot before the United States entered the Great War. He rose to the rank of major during the conflict, participating in combat operations until early October 1918, near the war's end, when he was reportedly shot down and wounded with gunshots to his lungs. Quote, he was not seriously injured as a result of the fall from his aeroplane, reported the Leavenworth Times. But the Times assessment proved premature and inaccurate. Pulsifer's wounds were significant. He never fully recovered and was placed on the retired list on September 20th, 1920. At age 27, his military career was over. The tragedy darkened when it was revealed that Pulsifer was not shot down by enemy fire, but was actually wounded by a nervous American sentry while sleeping in the back of an automobile as it was returning from the airfield. The bullet grazed his spine, lodged in his liver, and left him paralyzed from the waist down. Pulsifer eventually learned to walk again with the use of canes. He outlived Ike despite his wounds, dying in 1977, and he is interred at Mount Muncie Cemetery in Lansing, Kansas, which is about a 15-minute drive from where I'm giving this presentation today. Pulsifer's younger brothers followed him to West Point. Both brothers eventually attained the rank of Brigadier General. Pulsifer's brother, Ralph, even served on Ike's staff when he became commanding general of the European Theater in 1942. He was, uh, Ralph Pulsifer was an assistant adjutant general under Ike. Well, World War I was a time of frustration and triumph for Dwight Eisenhower. His record as commander of the tank training school at Camp Colt, Pennsylvania was exemplary, and yet he feared his quote unquote failure to command a unit in combat overseas would sink his career. I suppose we'll spend the rest of our lives explaining why we didn't get into this war, Ike wrote to a friend. This raises our final what if question. What if Eisenhower's wish had come true? What if he'd received that coveted combat command? We'll explore this road not taken by following the wartime journey of Aaron A. Plattner. Plattner was born on July 26, 1891 on his family's farm near Ellis in Ellsworth County, Kansas. He graduated from Ellis High School, where he held the school chin-up record in 1910. When he traveled to Topeka that October, he met a young man from Abilene at the National Hotel, also in town for the test, named Dwight Eisenhower. The boys sat next to each other during the exam, Ike to Aaron's right. They formed a bond and made plans to travel to St. Louis together, where they would take the West Point examination. Again, Ike is the primary nominee, Plattner is his alternate. Eisenhower recalls in at ease how he and another applicant snuck out from Jefferson Barracks after hours to explore the city, only to have to break back in in the middle of the night to avoid detection. Their apprehension would likely have resulted in their elimination of consideration for the academy. So here again is perhaps another instance of an Eisenhower luck or blessing. And Plattner, I surmise, was Ike's partner on this spree. Well, despite their bond and the high time in the big city, Plattner was nevertheless disappointed to have finished as the runner-up in the contest for the place at West Point. Quote, Aaron says he will keep trying, the Ellsworth Review headlight reported. Plattner returned home and joined the Ellsworth Mill and Elevator Company in Ellis. He was popular and active in church and fraternal affairs. 
The local paper reported in July 1911 that he was still trying to win a spot at West Point. The dream of military service faded, however, until the United States entered the war in April uh, 1917. Platner immediately attempted to join the Army, but twice failed the physical. The doctor suggested fresh air and exercise might improve his condition, and so he took to the streets selling Liberty Bonds to support the war. The work cured him, and he was accepted into the Army on his third attempt. Plattner was commissioned a captain of infantry on November 27, 1917, and set sail for France a month later. <coughs> Pardon me. Assigned as a master mechanic with an engineering unit because of his work, skilled work at the mill, Plattner soon petitioned for service with an infantry company. He, he was granted his wish and assigned to the 1st Battalion, 9th Regiment, 2nd Infantry Division. By September, he was leading the battalion. Plattner was in almost continuous action on the front from June 7th until November 3rd, 1918, when he was felled by a Minenwerfer while leading his men in the consolidation of a hilltop position during the final Allied offensive of the war. It was basically a, a mortar round. Wounded in the head and right leg, Pulsifer died on November 5th following surgery just six days before the armistice. Aaron Plattner was a true war hero. He was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, second only to the Medal of Honor, and the French Croix de Guerre for his actions during the Battle of blanc Mott in October 1918. Aaron Plattner was 27 years old. Eisenhower learned of Plattner's death only years later in October 1944 when he received a letter from Conrad Plattner, Aaron's brother. Although his acquaintance with Ike had been brief, it was memorable. The family had carefully preserved Ike's 1910 letter to Aaron detailing his plans for the trip to St. Louis. The preservation of this letter is remarkable given that Eisenhower was not to gain fame for another 30 years. Quote, when your brother and I got to St. Louis, we were indeed two farmer boys in the big city, Eisenhower replied. We stuck very closely together, almost in self-defense. I had not previously heard of his death, and I do regret that he could not have lived to realize his true ambition. Conrad wrote back, like others who gave their lives in World War I, Aaron's soul, I am sure, is cheering you and your men on as you pass over the same battlefields on which they fought, and appealing to you to complete the job this time to assure eternal freedom and peace. The world is proud of you, General Eisenhower, and, the, and in the name of my brother Aaron, I want to express gratitude for what you are accomplishing at the minimum loss of life. I'm sure it would be his wish to give thanks to the divine providence for the recognition and selection of such an outstanding leader as you to guide our destiny during such a crucial period, unquote. And then I believe in the next slide, we can see just the notice of, um, of Captain or Major Plattner's uh, death and was very well covered in the, in the local press. And in fact, he was disinterred in Europe and came back to Ellis in the early 1920s. And so there's even more follow-up from, from that time. Well, lethal mortar wounds, tuberculosis, paralysis, any one of these ends might have been Ike's had he taken other roads or made other decisions. The fact that these are the destinies of three of the young men who he, whom he encountered during those two fateful days of testing in Topeka continues to intrigue me. So what was the role of luck or providence in the life of Dwight Eisenhower and in his development as a leader? Uh, clearly, Mr. Plattner is a vote for the, the, prov the providential side. Um, on a practical level, I believe it's probably the perception of being lucky or chosen, which often played to Ike's advantage. Of course, this was a two-edged sword, however, as Ike's successes could be explained away by the fortunes of war or the whims of a deity, not by his own efforts. But in the main, uh, the reputation appears to have been to his benefit, which he kind of acknowledges in a 1965 Reader's Digest essay on leadership, in which he wrote, quote, it would be less than honest to say that good fortune being there in the right place when the lightning strikes does not play its part in getting good breaks. Finally, do the comparative alternative destinies of Plattner, Moore, and Pulsifer offered here today provide any real insight into Eisenhower's life and career? Well, I, I think they do. I think they remind us of just what a precarious and close run thing life can be. You know, to paraphrase Robert, uh, the poet Robert Frost, these are examples that the road not taken can make all the difference. Now, whether the inclination or decision to take a certain path is determined by Fortuna or Providence, however, I cannot say, but I can say we were lucky and blessed that Ike took the road 
or Rhodes that he did. By the way, Frost, uh, according to some critics, actually wrote that famous poem about the road not taken um, in, in agony over his decision of whether to join the British Army or not in, in 1915. Well, as a bit of a postscript, without running too long today, um, I just wanted to let you know what happened to the, the destinies of the other four applicants from those two fateful days in, in Topeka in 1910 when Ike was selected to go to West Point. Alan Vogeli was born June 21st, 1892 in Nebraska. He went to high school in Sabetha, Kansas, where he excelled as a fo fullback on the football field and captain of the squad. Local papers reported in 1917 that Vogeli had migrated to Arizona in 1915 and was doing well in the mining business. He entered the army late in the war and was discharged less than a, a year later. Vogeli moved to Texas and eventually retired as an oil field worker. He died in Quitman, Texas in 1982 when he was nearly 90 years old to win the last man standing award among the applicants. William Battelle was born April 3rd, 1892 in Illinois. He spent much of his childhood in Paola, Kansas where he attended the Ursuline Academy. Battelle went on to the University of Kansas, where he made the news in 1909 for discovering a dead body while duck hunting on the Wakarusa River south of Lawrence. Battelle moved to Davenport, Iowa, working in sales and finance. Following a personal bankruptcy in 1926, he joined the Battelle Grant Flower Company. Like Alan Vogeli, he moved to Texas and entered the oil business. The family hopes for a West Point appointment lived on through his son, who was named as an alternate for the Academy exam in 1937. Battelle apparently served in the Kansas National Guard sometime before World War I. He died in Illinois in 1967. He was 75 years old. Alan Neil Jones of nearby Enterprise was born there on January 1st, 1892. Jones was named the alternate to the Naval Academy. It's a mystery to me why he didn't go when Eisenhower, who was named first for Annapolis, couldn't go. But that story must be out there somewhere. Again, like his fellow applicant, Alan Vogeli, he moved to Arizona in 1915, where he also became involved in the mining business. Jones served in World War I with the 158th Infantry Regiment, a largely administrative unit, where he rose to become a battalion sergeant major. He returned home in April 1919 and spent the next 35 years as a superintendent with the Phelps Dodge Mining Company. He also served as the city manager of Clarkdale, Arizona. Jones died in 1975 at the age of 83. And finally, and this relates to uh, this next slide, uh, George L. Campbell of Wilsey, born July 5th, 1890 in Morris County, Kansas. Campbell received an engineering degree from Kansas State. He spent a career as a builder and contractor, including many New Deal Works Progress Administration projects during the 1930s. He built the old Glenn Martin Stadium at Kansas Wesleyan University, which I believe you can see now. Uh, it was actually raised in, in 2014, it's no longer there. And I raised the question a few moments ago of whether any of Ike's fellow applicants remembered him and the tests they took together all those years ago. And Campbell's prominent front page obituary says it all. Campbell, quote, was named an alternate to Dwight Eisenhower when the president was appointed to West Point. If Ike hadn't been accepted, Mr. Campbell would have been appointed, unquote. Campbell died in 1957 at age 66. Now, he actually was not listed as being an alternate. He was a he was a ways down the list, but I imagine as Eisenhower's fame grew, this kind of fish story of Mr. Mr. Campbell's uh, two days with Ike back in 1910 probably grew in, in, in proportion in his mind. But obviously, um, they are all, um, from Aaron Plattner to uh, George Campbell, proud of their brief association with Ike before he became famous. That uh, concludes what I have in terms of a presentation, but if anyone has any questions or comments, I'd be glad to hear them. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, if you have questions, you can uh, type them out, whether you're on Facebook or whether on YouTube, and or on YouTube rather, um, and I will ask those questions. We do have a question in the chat from Dr. Steve Lano. I am hoping I'm saying that correctly. If I'm not, I apologize sincerely. Uh, but he wants to know, do copies of this exam exist in the archive? No, unfortunately. Um, it's actually something I was thinking about yesterday. I, I want to go to Topeka and, and see if they have anything in the state superintendent's office records or Senator Bristow's papers. Um, but I guess it was unusual. It's the first time it had been done like that. 
both both the test being offered and that competitive nature for the appointment and the state superintendent being involved and that the Topeka teachers being involved. So it would, it would be interesting to see those questions. So I'm, I'll stay on that. All right, we have another question. It's a two part question uh, from Ortis Cafe. It says, was Ike superstitious? Did he buy into these things? Um, a little bit superstitious. I mean, he carried his good luck coins and um, his his thoughts on religion are, are interesting. Um, there's a very good article that is in the holdings of the library, the post-presidential records. And it's an interview with a guy named Sherwood Wirt, who edited Decision Magazine, which is put up by the Billy Graham um, organization. And he's a little reticent to talk about his religious, religious beliefs um, and about prayer in particular before battles. Um, but he clearly did believe, you know, that when there's nowhere else to turn, he, he did turn to prayer. Um, he, you know, did have some, I think, some feelings of, of, of that there were streaks of luck. Um, I don't think that Eisenhower, the way that some of the other folks who believe strongly in providence or luck, like George Patton, Eisenhower, I'm sure, did not believe that he had a destiny. And I think that that sure would work interviews another place you can see that when he talks about the lessons he learned from his mother and that is you play the hand the cards you you were dealt you play the hand you were dealt you're going to be presented with things in life and all you can do is respond to them as 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 best you can but i don't think he would have thought that there was some predetermined path that he was on towards where he he ended up as a general and president but it it's interesting and maybe this is true with every famous person you can look back and see these twists and turns their life that had the road gone one way, you know, things would have turned out differently. So, I mean, it, these are all really, again, really in, intangible, but um, yeah, again, I think I did hold on to some, some beliefs in good luck and in prayer, uh, but I don't know how much of my thesis he would have agreed with or embraced. So. <laughs> all right. Our next question, Scott Hedberg. Again, if I mess up your name, I am sorry. Um, do you have any idea of the mortality rates of army pilots during the period I was interested in becoming an aviator? I've, I've only, you know, it's very impressionistic, just that it was pretty high. And again, I think that's why his father-in-law put his foot down and saying, you know, if, you, if you're going into this, you know, let's not even waste time with you marrying my daughter because it's so dangerous. And of course, as all you Eisenhower scholars know, Ike, eventually when he was in the Philippines, and much older did get a get a, pi a pilot's license, and one of his best friends there was killed during a, a flight accident. Um, yeah, so again, um, who knows? It, it could have gone the other way. You could have. Um, <clears throat> Rebecca Perkins would like to know how much did Ike's marriage to Mamie impact his successful army career? Oh, I think it's agreed that she was a huge asset and a partner. I think, you know, she's seen as a partner both in his military career and in, and in his presidency. And um, as you know, in a professional army career, especially at, at that time, uh, there were so many kind of personal politics that, that involved one spouse that if they weren't also of the same sort of grade or rank material as the military member, that would, that would have probably had a, a negative impact. Um, so I think she was always seen as, as a great asset. And again, not just an asset, but also a partner in, in his career in the Army and in politics. Absolutely. We talk about that a lot here, about their partnership and um, really how much just being a, a great hostess and all of those things um, helped helped propel him, propel him forward. But not just that, though, just um, as someone, as a partner, someone he could speak, right. he could talk to and in that way. Um, next says, West Point seems to have a number of super, superstitious traditions, such as rubbing statue for luck on exams, rain on graduation means that class sees war. Um, did any specific USMA, United States Military Academy superstitions, superstitions resonate with Ike? Well, yeah, that's a great question. And one I was unaware of those um, those traditions. And so, you know, that's something else I'll have to follow up on because that's interesting to see. I mean, he, of course, he always felt that close connection with, with West Point um, after, you know, after he graduated. 
And so it would be fun to see if we could find instances of that carrying over through the rest of his of his life. All right, we have a kudos from our own Linda Smith. Great, good program, Tim. Oh, thanks. And Cliff, our colleague Cliff, would like to know if your shirt is lucky, which we want to bring up your shirt. Oh, the cool. Theodore Roosevelt shirt? Well, it must be. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt was one of Ike's favorite presidents, so it's there's got to be some good luck in there. And you need to get an Ike, you need to get an Ike shirt like this for the gift shop. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's how... Oh, Ordis Cafe said, can we talk about that shirt? Uh, <laughs> we did talk about it a little bit. Um, I yeah, think I mean, that's I, our last question. I don't see any other questions. So um, if there is none, we will wrap this up. You guys will just bear with us. We have a few announcements and then we'll say goodbye. Uh, our 2022 public programs are made possible by the Eisenhower Foundation and the Jeff Cope Memorial Foundation. We are so grateful to their support. We would not be able to offer these programs without them. Our next program is Ike's Book Club. We will we are reading the book Stagecoach by Ernest Haycock. That is one of uh, uh, that was one of Ike's favorite authors and favorite books. So that will be on September 13th. Please join us. It will be virtual, and um, yeah, just sign up and join us. And then our lunch and learn for next month will be on September 22nd, where we will welcome Dr. Chester Pack. And he is talking duck and cover, Eisenhower, the Cold War, and the atomic bomb, as you all know. If you have been following us all year, if not, you're new and you're new to us. Our theme for the year is the making of a leader. So all of our programs, just like this one, is uh, it works on that thing, works around that theme. And that day is September 22nd, it is at 7 o'clock p.m. So thank you again to Tim for that wonderful for this wonderful presentation. Thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. And I hope to see you at our next program. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.